Hello, I'm Lawrence Llewellyn Bowen. Fancy a play date? I'm about to have fun with the history, sociology and alchemy of interior design. Why don't you join me? This time, we're going to be playing with colour. You know, I do think it's extraordinary that we take colour so much for granted. If we were to enter our own private TARDISes and go back in time, you know, we'd be amazed at how everything was the colour of mud, or mud, or mud, accented with gravel. Because the only way of getting colour into your sad, peasanty life back then was to use whatever was at hand and whatever was free, like mud. Unless, that is, you were posh. In which case, you had total access to the rainbow, and by goodness you loved it. True colour, bright colour, colour to fall in love with came at a cost. Pigments were rare and precious and often only found on the other side of the world, which made colourful things the perfect expression of Screw you, poor people, I've got so very much money, I can blow my cash on pink, on lime, on teal, on cerise whilst all you can afford is a leftover shade of last year's potato. With all of that in mind, I find it kind of weird that our funny old world has become so colourphobic. Surely we should be enjoying the fruits of social revolution that has allowed us commoners, well, you commoners, access to all the bright sparkly things that Aristos hoarded in their palaces. I do have a theory why the denizens of the early 21st century fear colour, but I'm going to be spreading that one thick like butter on a hot crumpet for your pleasure in a later Fireside Chat. Let's start with the three key colours from which all other colours descend. The Trinity, the Father, the Son and the Holy Pantone. Blue, red and yellow. It's easy to think of blue as, as the daddy, the gentleman of the colour palette. It fits in, it's conventional, it's manly. Blue is the colour of some very emotive stuff. The sky, the sea, a baby's eyes. But it's actually something that's rarely found in organic nature. Sure, there's a few bluebirds, but there are virtually no plants that are true blue. And humans don't come in blue. Unless, of course, they're the issue of a Hindu demon, or they're an ancient Egyptian resurrected jackal god, or they're a smurf. Blue has often been used to denote deity. Basic blue was a colour that humankind found it was relatively easy to make for themselves using plants, such as grows as a weed woad. You've got to think William Wallace and his bright blue contouring, or, of course, this indigo, that which makes blue jeans blue. But getting heavenly blue, getting true blue, getting sky blue, getting crystalline blue was a lot more complicated and needed ingredients from over the sea, literally ultramarine. Now the stiff upper lip Romans hated blue. They thought of it as dangerous, as exotic, as seductive. Cleopatra was always seen as snakily blue and green and silver, whereas matinee idol Mark Antony was red and white and gold. In fact, blue remained the girl colour well into the 20th century, whilst boys, like Mark Antony, looked ravishing in red. Team Cleopatra got its blue from the lapis lazuli mines of Afghanistan, amazing places where the desert for miles around is the colour of Margaret Thatcher's eyes. This highly prized mineral started to make its way via the network of spicy silk routes from the Orient to Venice and then from Venice on to Europe. This was the first decades of the early medieval period, exactly the time when the early church fathers worked out that their growing religion needed a feminine touch. So they decided to promote Mary, Mother of Jesus, from the corps de ballet to the prima ballerina slot, 
and front row star of all of those altarpieces that the pre-Renaissance world was suddenly getting so good at. And hey, here's an idea. How about making her cloak that new and sumptuous, highly expensive, piercing blue everyone was talking about? On to the Renaissance proper, and artists' contracts would specify the exact amount of costly ultramarine blue they were supposed to use to satisfy their clients' rampant chromophilia. Titian's Bacchus and Ariadne shows this perfectly. For the floppy fringed and the romantic of the 1770s, blue became a colour of sighful spirituality, profundity and social change. Blue, because it was so stylelessly worn by the cotton-clad proletariat, got itself mixed up in revolutionary politics, and it became the key colour of the anti-monarchical revolutions in both America and France. Now, this is interesting. When we say we have the blues, it's likely to derive from the expression the blue devils, which comes straight to us from the overindulgent party on world of the steaming taverns and malodorous bars of the 1670s. It's literally the booze blues. In the Western world, well over 60% of the population say that blue is their favourite colour. They know that it won't excite anyone or cause them to be judged. It is the ultimate herd colour, the perfect shade of city suit. <laughs> So if blue is the grown-up, then red is the teen of the paint box, demanding, impatient and very, very attention-seeking. Of all the colours, red has the biggest physiological impact on humans, thanks to the way the colour red is focused at the very centre of your retina, which, being eyeball-shaped, duh, means that when we see red things, we see them deeper in our brains than any other colour. So red is the bully boy of the rainbow. It is the colour that makes you stop, the colour of command. It's also the colour that makes you go faster, that makes you feel energised. Statistically, red teams win more matches than blue teams. Sorry. Red armies win more than blue armies. The Roman Empire, the British Empire, and then, of course, there's McDonald's. Whilst being the colour of energy, aggression and Mars, red also, well, it makes your mouth water and helps you lose track of time, which is why red is so popular in old school Indian restaurants and gambling joints. In interior design, a red room is a small room, thanks to those dominant angry walls that optically come forward towards you. It creates spaces that feel enclosed, cosy, womb-like, which depending on your taste, might be comforting. There is a story of pirates on the Spanish main, and who doesn't love a story of pirates on the Spanish main, who heard that the most valuable cargo ever was being transported from the New World, and they set their hearts on capturing it. Following all of that frankly standard Yehamahartis, all of that rope swinging and cutlass slashing, cannon firing, and general piratical gory gore, they prized open the cargo hold to find, to their horror, that the boat was actually full to the brim of dead beetles. In fact, the beetles were the cargo. They were cochineal beetles from Mexico, which had recently been discovered to produce a carmine red of the very richest intensity, and as a result, had become more valuable pound for pound than gold. Silly pirates. Red is the only primary colour that boasts a specific name for a lighter shade of itself. Think about it. Light blue is light blue. Light green is, well, light green. But light red, we call pink. And funnily enough, pink, in fact, means serrated, as in pinking shears. So the term pink most likely comes from the flower, the pink, with its crinkly petals and its availability in several shades of soothing red. It'll be a natural fit. On maps of the world, the British Empire was pink, which is odd for us today since pink equals Barbie, but here we're definitely dealing with cartographic light red, 
To denote imperial possessions in bright scarlet would make any text unreadable. So Edwardian mapmakers compromised and they made the empire a percentage of red. Hmm, how very British. Yellow hasn't actually always been very mellow at all. In the medieval world, yellow was specifically meant as a badge of, well, disrespect. During the heated and hateful years before the Renaissance, minority communities were forced to sport yellow accessories as a way of singling them out and showing them to be highly bullyable. So, the Nazis were following a long tradition when they made Jews wear yellow stars. In art, yellow nearly always carried with it associations of illness, sickness, or indeed general pussiness. But come the lovely bright dawn of the Renaissance, and provided you reincarnate yellow as blonde, then blondes certainly had more fun. Botticelli reveled in fair-haired Madonnas, Venuses, and prancing primaveras, whilst in this wonderful painting by Carpaccio, these deliciously grumpy courtesans would have achieved their locks by spreading their hair out over the brim of a crownless hat and smearing it with either lemon juice or each other's wee, or both, while sitting on their balcony in the sun. In fact, if you go way back, before the moral big freeze of the Middle Ages, the ancient Greeks associated saffron yellow flimsy dresses with fast-living, loose-moraled party girls and statues of Aphrodite, the classical world's Kim Kardashian, were normally always painted with bright yellow head, despite the overwhelming evidence that Greek lovelies back then were predominantly sultry brunettes. Now, over to the contemporary but parallel world of the Orient. In the Eastern tradition, rich egg yolk yellow was legally defined as the sacred prerogative of the Chinese emperor. Only he was allowed to surround himself in shades of sunshine. When Western traders penetrated the bamboo curtain, intrepid tastemakers of the 1600s, well, they fell drop dead in love and became aesthetically aroused by oriental yellow. It sparked an exotic explosion of yellow decorating that culminated in the pasteboard Xanadu of the Brighton Pavilion. Lacquer, which was raised to a fine art form in the East, took the colour yellow particularly well, and with its exotic, rather louche oriental connotations, it became le couleur de rigueur for boy racer carriages of the Georgian period. When people talk fondly about yellow rooms, it's Monet's Mon Repose in Giverny that I suppose is everyone's favourite. He certainly didn't hold back on the yellow front. And under the apricot warmth of a French summer evening, it is a ravishing experience, but beware. Yellow is the colour of danger in nature and in decorating. It rarely works as a successful choice for rooms in the Northern Hemisphere where grey, green, chilly light bounces off an excess of landscape and weather, it will turn a daffodil yellow living room the colour of snot in an instant. And whilst we're discoursing on the chromatic possibilities of mucus, let's be brave and turn our attention to yellow's most pustulant incarnation, beige. Actually, there's a whole hell coven of nasty, clotted, dirty yellows. Taupe, fawn, magnolia, or fagnolia when used on the artex ceiling of a heavy smoker's boudoir, all are, let's face it, shades of nier. But beige is by far the pits. It's a French term, often the worst, to describe the undyed wool taken from the underbelly of a sheep, a goat, a lamb, a llama, or if you're feeling brave, a camel. So beige takes its colour from all of those wonderfully malodorous substances that are likely to turn the formerly white wool of a sheep's tummy yellowy grey. Beige is literally the colour of poo and wee and mud. Which brings us all full circle. But these days, shades of mud, shades of beige, far from denoting peasantry, now they suggest 
expensive understatement, or as I like to see it, class conscious chromophobia. This has all been very diverting, and I'm assuming that thanks to a greater familiarity with the rainbow, it all feels a lot less scary, this colour thing. And we're going to be playing with colour again. We're going to be wading into those wonderful betwixt and between shades like green, purple and orange, plus having a monochromatic moment with black and white. So, on to today's homework. Well, I think it's time to drink gin and carry on, don't you?